Good afternoon and welcome. It's THCB Gang, episode number 13. I am your host, Matthew Holt. Today is the 11th of June. We're back on our regular Thursday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern schedule. And having done a quick deviation last week, and I've uh, taken back over the reins from Zoe Khan. did a great job with the episode last week and uh, may find herself sitting in this chair much more often from now while I sit back with my, sit back with my feet up eating bonbons. All right. Great lineup today. Really looking forward to. We've got one of my uh, a guest is one of my favourite people in healthcare, uh, a quite retiring person called Casey Quinlan. Uh, she is the uh, she is at Mount Mighty Casey and also the host of the Healthcare is Hilarious uh, podcast and a bunch of other stuff. As well as Casey, who you'll meet in a second, we have a regulars or semi regulars. Raj Agarwal is back, basically a regular now, um, head of innovation at Jefferson Health System in Philadelphia. And as I said, fulfilling our, I'll make this joke for the last time, fulfilling our quota for the token, token brown British doctor from the Philadelphia area. <laughs> so I'm not here this week. Patient advocate extraordinaire, Grace Cordovano. Uh, healthcare, long-time healthcare policy and tech consultant, Vince Caradas from the wilds of rural Idaho. Health uh, privacy legal expert. And these days, um, chief regulatory officer at the startup, patient health record startup citizen, Devin McGraw and patient safety expert and years ago um, author of Demanding Medical Excellence, Michael Millison. So that's who we've got here today. So let's go live and uh, welcome everyone to the gang. I uh, hope you're all doing well today. We are going to start the way we always start. Maybe someone should tell us to do it differently, but that's how we do it, is that we are in our week at 725 of the COVID crisis. The, uh, <laughs> we're now in week three or four of the Protest, rebellion, Black Lives Matter. Is it, is it, is it an insurrection? Is it a change in, in, in tune? I don't know what it is. And uh, somewhere in the middle of this, the stock market goes up and down and the business of healthcare can, continues to, to go on and up and down and it's confusing the hell out of us. Stock market's great. I mean, Tesla stock was up over a thousand yesterday and now back down to 900 or something. Anyway, so with that, what do we notice this week? I'm going to start here with Vince. What are you saying, Vince? Hey, uh, thank you. Thanks, Matthew. I'm going to share an anecdote. I, I listened to a podcast while uh, biking this morning. The podcast was with the executive director of the American Public Health Association, Dr. George's Benjamin, and he was describing a, a story of his visit to Taiwan prior to uh, all this uh, COVID, and he was describing a situation where he was in the public health agency and actually watching real-time electronic health record information from local hospitals being fed in centrally. Isn't that a cool idea? Maybe we can learn something from Taiwan. <laughs> well, nobody uh, on this call have any opinions about that at all. <laughs> it, it, it's science fiction for us here in America. I know that. Uh, I, have a, I have a Taiwan and I go for you in a second. All right. There's uh, no money in it. <laughs> Grace, this week. Ooh, so uh, I've been following all of the messaging and there's so much misinformation, but I really almost fell out of my chair when the World Health Organization uh, came out with a messaging fail, in my opinion, on the rate of asymptomatic transmission, uh, refuting essentially what a uh, growing body of evidence has shown that there is asymptomatic transmission of COVID-19. And then this was followed by clickbait reporting by CNBC, which drove a media hysteria saying that this is all a hoax and we don't need to wear masks. And finally, uh, Andy Slavitt actually did an amazing job of clearing up through a number of different tweets. And then the World Health Organization walked back the next day to clarify, thank goodness, on what the messaging was. So I think we need a um, some PR and messaging work in this space, especially when in a pandemic. I yeah, hope I you're not it. suggesting we defund them. <laughs> oh, I didn't, don't put words in my mouth, didn't say that. Well, no, I'm just asking a question. <laughs> it, it's worth checking back on the blog. Anish Koka, who often doesn't agree with most of the rest of us on this, uh, on some of these topics, wrote an interesting piece about the WHO historically and how it's been doing. Raj, what have you seen the last week? So it's interesting. Um, there's a annual conference, uh, um, it's called SAGES, which is the Conference of Laparoscopic Surgeons. It's uh, American-based, uh, uh, and it was due to be in Cleveland. Um, it, it was due in April, and then it was moved to August, and now they've just gone to a virtual conference. And um, 
a lot of that is happening. And then, you know, the dear Matthew Holt was tweeting about this this morning as well, uh, about virtual conferences and so forth. So it kind of all, all fitted together. Are we ever going to meet up in person and have those conferences? And are virtual conferences really as good as the, uh, uh, the real thing? I think not. Um, and so uh, that's, that's what I saw this week and uh, uh, quite concerned about it. Yeah, I'm having to buy my own drinks. It's very sad. Um, <laughs> uh, Devin, the last week. Yeah, so starting to see some um, upticks in the case counts in some of these states that have eased their um, restrictions, and it was predictable, and it is indeed happening, but it certainly doesn't seem to be motivating um, those states to pull back um, the opening of the economy, which you know, I think begs a lot of questions, one of which being, you know, are we as Americans just not well suited to stay home and and not get out? Um, or are we just we just don't have the patience for, um, you know, to watch the economy tank? Well, but in the service of saving lives, I, you know, I think that there's a whole set of complicated issues around this. People who live in states that have opened up are grateful. In the meantime, again, we're doing this at the sacrifice of of um, human life and well-being, and um, what does that mean for policies going forward? Uh, Casey, now you've got the, the the gist of this. Come off you and tell us what you uh, what you've seen just that's piqued your interest in the last week or so. Well, I live in Richmond, Virginia, so this I, I'm 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 not going to do that, but I could go on at length about what I've seen. In the Isn't there a street week. somewhere with a few statues and a few people? Who maybe yeah. Well, the thing that made my week was Jeff Davis ending up in the gutter where that traitor has always belonged. <laughs> I am not from Richmond. I live in Richmond and have for the last twenty years. But let me tell you, when I got here and I saw the iconography on what I call Losers Lane, my people fought in blue uniform. I was kind of gobsmacked and realized why, you know, not as though I needed a clue, but the the confluence of COVID and 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 the and Black Lives bleh, Black Lives Matter as a public health issue has still been, you know, like sort of separated into two silos from the news perspective, but they're inextricably inextricably intertwined. So I've just been watching that like crazy. And on the misinformation thing, tune in later to this week's edition of Healthcare is Hilarious because I'm talking to James Heathers, the PhD behind the Twitter feed, just says in mice. We had a good conversation, so it'll be entertaining. It was before Black Lives Matter hit, but it was after COVID was around, so. All right, very interesting. Michael, the last week. Uh, well, uh, we, we got a couple of interesting things. For instance, uh, can you get COVID if you get tear gassed and uh, all of you guys are together and uh, all those fluids are, are, are flowing? And then can you get tear gas if you're a, a middle-class white guy who voted for Trump and get together with other middle-class white guys in a crowded restaurant in the South? Um, I, I think that uh, uh, to Devin's point, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, she forgot the third choice. One is, do we have the patience? Two, uh, do we as a nation uh, actually believe that there's an us pluribus unum or as opposed to a them. So for instance, if there was a headline in the Wall Street Journal, uh, COVID-19 sweeps through Aspen, uh, the uh, uh, Fire Island uh, and uh, California homes, if we had a weeping- The Hamptons. The Hamptons, right. If we had a weeping mother from uh, uh, Connecticut, uh, that might change things. All right. Okay, uh, so I, I've got a couple of things for the week which I've noticed. So one is very recent. Um, so saying something about the state of science and 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 safety in our current environment, in current environment, the public health officer, chief public health officers, both female doctors for both uh, the main county in Ohio, sorry, the state of Ohio, and the and Orange County, California, have both resigned because of basically people coming to their house and threatening them. And sort of stuff you didn't expect to happen if you were going to be a public health officer. So that to me is, is one indicator that, that things are still away from normal. And the second thing I've been watching with interest is sort of more on the business side of the healthcare systems. And uh, perhaps I'll we'll drag you into this one, Raj, in, in a minute. But um, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of back and forth now, a lot of media coverage now, or something that we've been talking about for a while. And I've certainly been tweeting about. And Paul O'Neill, who's been on uh, the, the gang occasionally, has been tweeting about a lot, which is. 
uh, health systems with huge endowments have been getting essentially funds from the CARES Act in, in Medicare and, and been keeping it. They've been complaining about losing money. We'll talk about Jefferson maybe in a minute, but uh, Bob Walker was on this the other day about UCSF losing five billion bucks a day. And he had a long tweet stream about this. And I did point out to him in, in the Twitter, which he hasn't replied to, that you know, UCSF has got an endowment of four, nearly $4 billion. And perhaps that may be there to make up for some of these rainy, you know, maybe that's the rainy day fund. So we have to discuss a little bit about, we, we're, you know, Devin, you said we're opening up a little bit. I mean, states, one of the things we're starting to open up is use of healthcare services again. So we should talk a bit about that. And Raj, that's probably going on. So why don't we start there with the sort of uh, the opening up piece, Raj? What's the state of play now in Philadelphia and Jefferson about kind of getting back to quote unquote normal? Even if we're not going to meet meeting yeah. in the bar as laparoscopic surgeons, you know, what about the actual surgery part that you're doing? Yeah. So um, I was in the hospital today and uh, uh, saw the president of our hospital and uh, he was saying, why aren't you in scrubs, Raj? And uh, my exact response to him uh, was, when I'm in scrubs, I'm making money for the health system. And when I'm wearing regular clothes, I'm actually spending that money doing innovation stuff, right? Um, <laughs> and so, you know, two weeks ago, we started back with elective surgery two, three weeks ago. So I've been operating this week, last week. And really, um, we have tried to open up as much as possible in terms of our elective surgery. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm only 20% clinical, but uh, for the next few weeks, I'm pretty much going to be operating as much as my full-time colleagues, just because we have such a backup of cases that need to get done. Um, and so we're opening up the ORs and, and getting that done. Um, from a day-to-day -day process, it's a little bit more clunky. You've got to you know, wear three sets of masks and visors and uh, all that kind of stuff. So it's uncomfortable, it's clunky, it's taking longer. Um, there's more clicks that I have to do on my EMR to make sure that the patients understand that they're coming in and uh, uh, there's a risk they could get COVID. They're all being tested beforehand. So a lot more kind of process um, that needs to be done. But the way I look at it, I was in the OR on Tuesday, did a couple of cases. It felt like a normal day in the OR. All the ORs were open. Um, they were busy. Um, uh, folks were doing cases. Um, the, the floors are busy as well. So we really are ramping up. And, uh, you know, going back to my kind of jestful comment about the president of our hospital, I mean, that's, that's where we need to come back with the revenue. And, and that's the driver. Um, in terms of not just the, the cases, but the diagnostics, the other interventions and so forth. So certainly from a Jefferson perspective, um, we're uh, starting to pick that up. Now, is that something that we can you know, pick up the backlog in, uh, in a few months? I think not. I think you know, we can do what we can, but also some of my patients say, actually, I don't want to come in till September or October, right? So some of the elective stuff, like I don't want to risk it. Um, and, and that's very, very fair, right? Um, uh, that might lead to them having further disease, further complications. That might mean that the surgery is more complex and so forth. But, you know, that is absolutely a fair. The other thing that's interesting is two weeks ago, I did a clinic and probably 70% of the patients, though they could come in, said that um, they just wanted a telemedicine visit. To be fair, there's probably uh, another factor there that um, we were having riots in Philadelphia that weekend. And so... That's uh, a different aspect, but I've got a clinic on Monday and I was looking at it. Only one patient is gonna be telemedicine. Everyone else is coming in person. So um, whilst we had this great show of telemedicine and it's all gonna be great. And um, you know, maybe I should tell our friends at Teladoc and uh, Amwell uh, about the, the stock price, but you know, literally out of 20 patients, I'm gonna have one doing telemedicine uh, next Monday. So that's the kind of uh, coming back up. It's kind of, uh, trying to get up to business as usual, to be quite frank. Hey, Raj, right, like have they thought of uh, uh, opening up the ORs on Sunday to make up the uh, uh, thing? Are they having doctors operating on Sunday? No, we have. We talked about <laughs> that a few weeks ago. We talked about doing evening operating. We talked about doing Saturdays and Sundays, and it hasn't happened. I mean, I, I'd be happy to come in on a Saturday so, or a so, Sunday and so, pick up cases. Okay. And, and you guys aren't even unionized. They could do it if they wanted to. I mean, you know, there, there was once a, uh, there was an article in a health affairs blog a few years ago where they talked about having to be more efficient and blah, 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 and, you know, right. run it better. And they did not mention the word doctor. They literally did not mention the word doctor <laughs> instead of being open on Sunday. And it's like, uh, so, you know, if, if, if a patient was in the hospital and said, look, so do you charge me less on Saturday and Sunday because, you know, you're doing fewer services? <laughs> 
Obviously not. And I mean, it'd be interesting to see from Dr. Ja, um, Saurabh Ja, you know, what's happening in the diagnostic space in radiology, because right. maybe they're opening their MRs and their CAT scanners to do uh, elective stuff on the weekends. Uh, I don't know. If you've got a backlog, if the backlog is a health issue for certain patients, right? I mean, the ones you don't yep. want to come to them. If it's a health yep. issue, if you put, if you, if you raise your hand and phrase it this way, from an ethical point of view, if you could prevent patients from having health problems by having the doctors work on weekend, why would you not have doctors work on weekend? What's the ethical answer to, to, to that question? <laughs> Somebody else? <laughs> Double time. But, but, and, and, and I'm not talking about you, Rob. But, but, it's it's the it's the way doctors think that if you want to discuss the ethics of evil insurance companies, evil pharma companies, et cetera, et cetera, that's fine. But if you want to discuss the way the guild has its own paradigm of how it looks at things and whether or not that's always ethical, it doesn't even come up. And and I think in this case, given the backlog, given it's zero, it's a question that should come up. But I'm waiting for JAMA to bring it up. <laughs> I can hear the emergency yeah. medicine folks across the nation. <laughs> Horse laughing at this, like, yeah, y'all are finding out what it's like to have a seven-day schedule. Well, exactly. <laughs> well, uh, look to, to be to be clear, this is kind of part of part of a bigger picture, right? Because um, what uh, Raj just said is that is kind of the question, and and uh, I was chatting offline with Justin Master about this, which is the idea is it, we talked about telemedicine, you know, going up and replace all the outs that this, but it, it replaced a lot of them. It drew, grew by factors of hundred, you know, hundreds of many institutions. We saw big changes. Everyone said it's not going back in the bowl. If it starts going back in the bowl, we go back to the way we were. And I don't know, Raj, why, why would somebody come in when they wouldn't have to come in? I mean, is that something wait, about- Matthew, Matthew, we're talking about surgery, not- <laughs> but, no, 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 I understand you're actually getting the surgery out of the, the, the clinic. Surgery. But, but this this, this morning, I heard I heard right. Seema Verma wow. say that they're going to uh, look at the rates for telemedicine. And while yeah. telemedicine today to. is on yeah. parity, she said, well, we're going to eventually be paying more for the in-office visit because there's still costs associated yeah. so, with it. So, Raj, so, is there an in -off, is there a reason, a, you know, a, a clinical reason for that in-office visit to be to be not telemedicine before the surgery or after surgery? Or, or, or should we, you know, is that a sort of, could we be reflinking that word? No, what we've said in our practice and our, you know, I do bariatric surgery, the first post-op visit should be in person, right? But after that, unless there's a specific reason, then it doesn't need to be in person. Then it could be telemedicine. And we've been very clear with our patients that you can uh, have it done by video, right? So there, Good. So there are two things, De Devin, then me. <laughs> Devin. Well, I, I mean, here's the other thing that's going on here that I think people might be undervaluing is that when all things being equal, when I'm busy and I'm, I don't, and I could do a telemedicine visit, I would much rather do one. When I don't have a lot of other things going on and I'm not able to see people in my life and somebody's offering me an opportunity to go into a place that's probably pretty safe so I can talk to a person about what's going on in my healthcare, I might actually opt for it. <laughs> so this is this is the same thing as the conference business, right? Yeah. This is, are you are you going there? To, is, is this a job? Is this something you have to do this transaction? Or is this a social outing, right? There's an old Japanese joke about the woman who didn't get, you know, that her friends were all missing at the doctor's office and they said, why isn't she there? She says, you couldn't come because she's sick. You know, it's the, it's the same, basically. So there's a question about what, you know, whether, and this comes down to it, is, are we gonna change the way we've always done, done things? But wrapped up in that, and I'll go to Grace in a second, because you mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, Grace. Wrapped up in that, and this is the stuff that Vince and I have been talking about at conferences for 20 plus years and hasn't really <laughs> happened, is that this idea of if you want to go to a new kind of health system where you want to manage and monitor and measure and constantly survey the people who have got chronic illness or have got acute illness, and you know, you're not actually directly operating on them, but you, have, you want to watch them all the time, and you can use all the technology that Roger's been investing in and rolling out Jefferson and elsewhere. That is like a, a 24 seven business. And you've got to change the underlying work practices and, and, and way people do this, the way people do things to get there. So, you know, the question is that we're not paying for that. Maybe we're going to pay for it in a different way. And we're, it sounds like we're not culturally ready for that. I don't know. Grace. So I'm going to come and tell you, so New Jersey just lifted their stay at home order here. So we're all kind of holding our breath as to what does this actually mean? No one knows if they should stay, go, we're supposed to wear masks, but we're allowed to go out and you can have 500 people out, but, but wear a mask and stay socially distant. We're, we're all sorts of confused here in New Jersey. However, in 
cases where we are going to the office and electives have resumed, a question that's coming up from patients and families, specifically high risk, immune compromised. Um, so hospitals are coming out with messaging and videos on the measures they're taking to keep patients safe, to come back to the facilities for the care that they need, that they're doing temperature screenings, that there's questionnaire screenings, that there's universal masking, that there's more cleaning and sanitization. But patients want to know when they're put into the waiting room or they're put into their exam room, what about the air? Is there anything being done like an air purifier? Is there UV sanitization when it's recirculated? What's happening in that case? Is that a worry? I'll give you an example. My daughter has allergy shots and immunotherapy that she goes for. We go directly into the tiny exam room and we wait there and she has to wait for 20 minutes after her shots in order to be reevaluated. So we could be in there for about an hour. Um, and as someone who has been strict in sheltering at home, um, while we have the mask, I don't know, I'm sitting in there for an hour and they're saying in a poorly ventilated enclosed space, not good. So uh, should I worry? Should I not worry? What, what are your thoughts there? Uh, I, I would say be, there's, a, there's a company I just ran into the other day called Molecule, which is the most powerful uh, filtration, you know, air purifier device. If you see back, I'm thinking about buying stock in it. But, you know, I, I, what, what I would yeah, say I mean, is that, HVAC is a huge vector issue. Yeah. Um, it, you know, for, for all kinds of nasty. That's, that's why this stuff spreads on cruise ships like wildfire, right? It's all the yeah. same. It's I mean, I'm old enough to remember Legionnaire's disease yeah. when it first oh, showed God. up. Me too. Me too. Uh, maybe we should start seeing patients on airplanes. <laughs> Well, that's Don't the they have thing. that filtration systems in terms of the air, like they, they certainly tout it. But but the other thing that's going on here is it, so if you look at travel, that's starting to pick up back up again. We're not, you know, it, it, it's going to when do we get back to normal and what does normal look Last like? Last year on this day, I was in Tunis for <laughs> RightsCon. You know, last year was a big year, much travel. And this year I'm like, oh, I'm stuck. Right. Well, I mean, that that's that's absolutely right. Right. And that, that's been the case for, for most of us. Roger was saying we're not going to, you know, he's not going to the conference he was going to supposed to be at in, uh, in August. Um, but there's a question of as, as we pick up, what, what happens next? So Devin and Vince, you both raised this and have been honest a, a little bit. I want to I talk about how do we tell, A, you know, what is happening when we pick up, when we open up and start going, uh, how does it impact us? And then B, what does that mean for the way we can start thinking about um, you, you referenced the Taiwanese case, Vince, of, of looking at real-time data, understanding how to do better than we did the last time around in terms of getting this. So I'd love your both your thoughts on that. Let's go first. Yeah, I mean, it, it feels to me like opening up um, in, in a more responsible way um, requires a lot more testing and a lot more surge of surgical, more, you know, sort of very careful approaches to having people stay home to the extent that we can, and you know, Vince, I, I, I want to, I want you to talk about the, the, the piece that you were the lead author on that's going to be in the, the healthcare blog, um, shortly around some of this. But it's, you know, all the questions that we had around sort of contact tracing and can we do it and how do we deploy technology, I think, are going to be even more important as we sort of realize that we have, we, we just don't have the stomach to shut down the economy, and therefore we have to be out and about. So, and we're seeing the case uh, numbers crawl back up again, as we probably all predicted that they would. So what are then are the next steps in terms of how do, how do we have a, a better environment and not kill so many people as we sort of come to this realization that we have to open up the economy? I'll, I'll mention a little bit about the article that uh, yesterday I just sent off to uh, Zoya Devon and I and uh, another colleague, Eric per Paraxlis, uh, have written an article looking at what we call the 10 reasons why contact tracing is particularly difficult with, uh, with COVID-19. And I'll, I'll share a couple of, uh, of nuggets, a few bullet points. Uh, we need somewhere between 100, depending on which estimate you want to buy, somewhere between 100 to 300,000 contact tracers. The, uh, there's an organization tracking this called Test and Trace. It's a private organization. And their best estimate is that the states, not, not the feds, are on track to hire about 67,000. And that 
translates to about only a dozen states being where they should be in hiring contact tracers. Uh, you know, this is this is public. I'm not a public health background person, but but you know what I'm seeing is we're just not doing public health 101 here. You know, when when you have um, tuberculosis or you have measles, you go and find out who have these, these people been in contact with, and we need to be doing that, but we're really not gearing up for it. So it it doesn't look like uh, it, it's not creating a very optimistic scenario in my mind about uh, what we should be expecting for the next several months. We're not we're not doing the basics here. Okay, so I see you and Michael and Rod jump in. Well, you know, the, the, speaking of living in Richmond, Virginia, and harking back to the Civil War, there is this myth in the Lost Cause that the Civil War was fought for states' rights. It wasn't. It was fought for slavery. If the right of states to hold slaves, that's what it was about. But this is a, another flaw in our system where you have 50 different ways you can approach this problem. Right. Whereas, but borders are meaningless. Anybody who's ever lived next to an international or even a state border knows how meaningless geographic, you know, political borders are. And as a result, if you live in New Jersey, which I lived in the New York City metro area for almost 30 years, you can wake up in New Jersey, go to work in Connecticut and have 27 meetings all the way through all kinds of downstate New York, all in one 24 hour period, which explains at least a tiny bit of why that became such a hot zone. But I, you know, I don't get the, that there's a political will or enough of an us in this yet as Americans to really do what needs to be done to get this thing under control. We're already starting to see the front end of a second wave in places that have had problems previously. And we're seeing the first wave ramp up in places that thought they were getting off scot-free. Mm -hmm. So, ha, what fun. Michael. Yeah, and I, I want to I build on that. I mean, um, you know, you, you can't talk about what we should be doing with public health when the president of the United States blatantly goes against the advice of the CDC and the NIH and, and everything else, and uh, states go with it, right? So there is a Republican doctor's caucus, right? Uh, the doctor's caucus in Congress, they happen to all be Republicans uh, and, and nurses. And, you know, they're very vocal against the Affordable Care Act. Have they said, look, we are doctors. This is not a political issue. This is a public health issue. No. Have you had pushback from medical groups in the in, in the red states who say to the governor of Florida or Georgia, "No, you know, we you know we we love Donald Trump. We hope he has six terms, but in this case, you know, he's wrong." And so, what you have is you have, as other people describe, you have a cult, whereby when the cult leader says something, whatever it is people go along and Fox and those people go along. And so if the, it, it's not just federal versus states, is when the, when the person who leads the cult says something and all the cult people in the, in the states go along, we're not gonna have Tracer, we're not gonna have the rest. And, and it, it's a terrible thing. Uh, I'm not sure what it leads to except blaming China. Uh, and, and you know, what, what are you gonna do? It, it, it is literally, unprecedented for this kind of thing to happen. It's not in the playbook for someone just to go blatantly against science and hope for the best. And so that's that's what we as a country are gonna do. And it's, uh, you know. Well Bud, said, you, well you, said you, Michael. Yes. Uh, no, I just wanna follow on from what both Casey and Michael said. And as a resident alien here in the US, um, uh, just to say, the biggest challenge here is, is leadership and clarity of communication. I mean, Grace said that right at the beginning with the WHO. So this is not just an American issue. I mean, we look at um, what happened in New Zealand. There was huge clarity from the top and mm -hmm. everyone abode by that. And, and now you look and you say, gosh, you know, I, I, I wish I lived there was one of those five million people in New Zealand. Right. Because now they're out of it. And I think the likelihood of anything bad happening over there is uh, pretty much zero. Right. So the, the key is how do you get people to um, engage and understand what they need to do? So if, um, you know, the Fed, feds are saying something, the state of New Jersey is saying something else, and then the, the mayor of um, uh, the town is saying something else, then how do you have any clarity? And then the community is, you know, split. You can go in lots of different levels. Um, that's the real issue here that, you know, we're all very intelligent people and we aren't sure what to do, right? 
Um, and then you look at the rest of society. Um, it's it's a real cluster here, right? I mean, uh, and then I saw Shish Jar on the CNN last night saying, you know, the, the curve is coming down so slowly. We're looking at 800 to 1,000 deaths per day for the next 100 days. Um, I mean, that's going to double the death count um, right out through to September. And there doesn't seem to... I mean, you know, in innovation, we use the concept of the burning platform. There doesn't seem to be that burning platform that people are dying every day and we really need to do something about it. We need strong leadership and communication and clarity to actually engage society in this. I mean, it's very depressing. Casey? Well, looking at the history in this country, and uh, yeah, I think we've infected enough of the rest of the world with our thinking. It's not, it's, it's at its most extreme here, but it has happened to other places is this need to remove the idea that there is any public money going to be set out toward the public health or public good or taking, you know, healthcare or uh, any kind of, you know, human rights issue. It's like, oh no, we're gonna privatize everything. Let the market determine what the solution to this problem is which is great if you're looking for a better way to build a house or a better way to build a building or to create a new product to do insert purpose here. But when you're trying to take care of humans, last time I checked, we're a herd animal. When you're trying to take care of humans, looking out for number one fails every time. And this is a perfect example of why that kind of libertarian thinking that's been going on basically since World War II is hashtag fail and yeah. this is a good example oh, yeah. we're, well, we're, not, we're not we're not we're not the same country i mean we've had this problem of communitarian versus individualistic values for our entire country's history and it's playing out very largely here to me what is different about the environment we're in now is that the 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 sides the different sides on this issue didn't doubt and attack the science necessarily they might have they might have gilded the lily a little bit, emphasized some facts over other facts to make their case, but they didn't basically call what is clearly, you know, the, the most significant health issue we have faced in the world in decades, if not ever, a hoax. Right. right. As though it's I, false. I'm to Devin for, for a moment. No, no, I want to not only agree with that and, and semi defend libertarians versus know nothings. So, <laughs> I, I remember reading Capitalism and Freedom when I was in college by Milton Friedman, okay? And Milton Friedman was the godfather of libertarian economics, right? So he would be against, for instance, regulation of hospitals for safety because if your hospital burns down and kills somebody, the market will learn that and people won't get business. The one exception that he made to his argument that we shouldn't license physicians because it just controls the supply and the prices go up was epidemics. Okay, so Milton Friedman, the godfather of real libertarianism, was if there are problems that are affect other people other than the people in the direct market transaction, that is a public good and you should take care of it as a public good. What we have now is not libertarians, but know nothings who attack science and who um, see things through an odd lens that, that took us, for instance, from global warming, where we should have a conservative solution or a liberal solution, to somehow it being conservative to say that it's not happening. I mean, it's, it, it, it's sort of bizarre if you look at conservative and liberal, but if you look at cult and crazies versus rational, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, that, I mean, I, I, I'd love that. I mean, there are two, two ways to think about this. And we are, uh, John and Neptune was on the show as a guest last week. Was mostly talking about the uh, the Black Lives Matter protests and other stuff, but he said, "Look, you know, uh, sp speaking as, as as a black man living in New York City, he said the whole the I, I regard this as you've got to come back to convincing people, you've got to you've got to sort of come back to money, and if you can figure out Casey's point that we didn't we didn't spend whatever we should have spent on public health, we didn't do what the Kiwis did or do what the, they did in Taiwan or even Czechoslovakia, the Czech Republic, where they've been they've been wearing masks and getting religious about that." And now, like, it's, like we just said, we're attacking the, the, the county health officers so much that these, these female doctors quit their post rather than keep going because of the ones they're scared of. We're attacking them. Um, but all of that has led to what may be a three or four or five trillion dollar mistake, right? We have to self so borrow that money. Somebody will at some point have to pay it back. Hopefully I'll be dead by then. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a real thing. 
um, that because we didn't approach this way, we had to shut down the economy, had to borrow this money. And now we're saying open up, it didn't happen, it's a hoax. There is the one thing which I think we have, we've got to be really careful about. And this is where it links back to the Black Lives Matter issue and to the, the feeling, the, the, the whole sense of inequality that we've got in, in, in the US particularly, but in the West as a whole, which is that most of the people who are dying have been in nursing homes, or many of them, a, a plurality of being in, in nursing homes. Many of them are old or getting elderly, have pre-existing conditions, and a highly proportion, disproportionate number, as, as uh, Kim Mellard said in, in his piece a couple of weeks ago, you know, have been black or, or, or Hispanic or have been a minority population. You know, who, who, and there was a great podcast that uh, Bob Walker had the other day, he had Mark Smith from Cal original well, he's done many things, and Mark Smith was the head of the California Healthcare Foundation for many reasons. He's going, well, it wasn't just that, you know, one day we sh the, the virus showed up and it shows those people. <laughs> there was a reason why it's gone that way. And, and part of it's, you know, socioeconomic and part of it's what we've done for hundreds of years. So a lot of it's brought that into relief. So I'm just at the point where we can argue that there's this cultism and then maybe half the cult will leave in November and maybe half of them will head to the hills of Idaho and join Vince with their AK-57s or whatever and go crazy. But it still seems to me that, you know, we've got to deal with the facts that we have now where half the states in the country are run by people who are espousing some of the views that, that Michael says is cult or crazy. And yet the, the virus doesn't care, right? So I'm trying to figure out how, and yet I walk outside of Marin County nice liberal part of, of Northern California. And I think there are three people in hospital now with COVID. I mean, it's almost left the news. No one seems to care. And we're, you know, we're, we're opening up. I'm still stuck there. So Casey, you had your hand up and Grace, you had your hand up. But uh, I just well, think we, we're just in a tricky moment. Well, no, it is a very tricky moment. And Michael bringing up Milton Friedman, you know, I ended up muting myself because I was going to start screaming. <laughs> you can scream, um, it's okay. We no, like, oh, it's all right. Stuff. No, screaming F-bombs. It's, you know, it just- I, I like, Milton Friedman yeah, too, anyway. I was in But no, I mean, the last time I traveled, really, I mean, other than to go to DC for Health Data Palooza and the National Health Policy Conference, just before my knee surgery in February, was last year I was, well, uh, you know, I was supposed to speak at Cochrane. I got tear gassed instead because it was in Santiago, Chile. But the, you know, Chile was the lab for Milton Friedman's, I mean, he, he sent his Chicago boys. He had them come to the University of Chicago, trained him up in his thinking about, you know, how things should go. He sent them down there and they gave Chile Pinochet. It was great, man. And, you know, with the support of the Nixon administration. Um, but those folks have had it. Uh, you know, they, they, they literally had it. They even tear gassed me. It was accidental. You know, it was fine. I, I understood why they were mad and I was okay with that. But the problem is, is that, you know, I, I just, I, I sense that this move toward nationalism, which is global um, and certainly happening here, um, gets in the way of an awful lot of what needs to happen next around how we get ascendant on this small microscopic thing that could kill us all if we're not careful. But uh, you know, as far as to the thing that most of the people that are dying are in nursing homes and have pre-existing conditions, I'll push back a little bit with saying that I lost one of my best friends in New York recently and he was not in a nursing home. Um, he was in Lenox Hill Hospital for over a month and then died. Uh, but he did not have, you know, like severely compromising, um, you know, additional conditions that would have led to this. Certainly he was older, I mean, like me, uh, but he was healthy and, and still occasionally freelanced, but now he's dead. So it's not just folks in nursing homes. Yeah, us olds. But, um, you know, that's one of the reasons that the fact that my gym is open as of this week, I don't know yet. I'm waiting. I'm getting a COVID uh, serum test, um, you know, an, in, in, an immunoglobulin IG test. Thank you. It's easier. Next Wednesday at LabCorp because I'm curious. I mean, I have no idea um, whether or not it's even going to give me a real answer. But hey, I'm a scientist. I like to get answers to things. Ask questions, get answers. So I, I, well, we've got about 20 minutes uh, left of the call I, of, the, of, the, of the game today. I'd like to sort of shift gears a little bit and think about what we think it's going to mean for the sort of the ongoing development of the health system. Um, 
there are probably two aspects of this, right? And I'll grab you, Raj, and, and Vince for this a second. But two aspects of this. One is I want to get back to this issue of are we going to change anything or not? And the second aspect is the longer term vision. Now, one thing that you mentioned about, you know, a, uh, age in relation to COVID is that this seems to have changed a big deal politically and that, that Trump's lead um, that was in the opinion polls for amongst, amongst people over 65 appears to have completely shifted and they've now found another old guy they can vote for instead, <laughs> right? Whether or not he was the, apparently we were gonna get an old white man of whichever flavor to represent us this, this, this fall. Um, so I guess the question is, short term, are we back to normal? Long term, if we have Biden, if we have uh, a move back towards a, you know, a, a, a more democratic, but maybe a more centrist democratic platform than, than some might have thought, are we going to see any significant change in the way we think about delivering funding and paying for healthcare? Because I'm seeing right now a lot of people saying, oh, we have to think about new ways. Uh, Raj, your boss, Steve Klosko, was quoted by the folks at Health Evolution uh, Summit today, you know, about a, about a new way for CEOs to think about it. And, and I can see a lot of conversations happening, but I wonder if we're going to have any of that policy change that actually, you know, is going to fuel things about increased use of telemedicine, remote monitoring, and quote unquote, defunding healthcare in some asterisks, especially in some of the things that we perhaps do too much of. So I'll, I'll leave that as an open question, but I think policy-wise, where, where are we thinking now? And we, I lost this question a few weeks ago. Where do we think we, we are now in terms of any kind of significant change coming out of the politics of this and the experience of this? So Raj, I'll start with you. Great. Um, I just want to go back to uh, what we were talking about, about the elderly and uh, draw the attention um, to a perspective that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine two weeks ago from colleagues at Penn, which is really about nursing homes. I'm just going to quote, they said, nursing homes were like tinderboxes, ready to go up in flames with just a spark. The tragedy unfolding in nursing homes is the result of decades of neglect of long-term care policy. Long-term care in the United States has been marginalized for decades, leaving aging adults who can no longer care for themselves at home reliant on poorly funded and insufficiently monitored institutions. The coronavirus has exposed and amplified a long-standing and larger problem, our failure to value and invest in a safe and effective long-term care system. It's one of the best perspectives I've read for some time. And I think it really blows that apart in terms of, you know, we, we've had this kind of patchwork quilt, um, what does our friend um, uh, Ian Morrison call it? You know, pimp my healthcare ride of just adding lots of different things onto this uh, multi-layered chassis. Um, and uh, I don't see, to be quite frank, in, in the media much being talked about. I mean, it's very sad that uh, 50, 60 percent of these cases, certainly in these states, are around nursing homes. You know, that's where it started in Kirkland. Um, but I don't see much, um, much talk about how do we uh, really impact our long-term care for our adults, you know, our aging population and so forth. Um, how do we use innovation from that, tele, um, telemedicine, uh, social engagement, um, remote monitoring and so forth. And that's just quite frankly dreadful that yeah. we're not taking this. And it's been three months now. Casey? Well, the nursing homes could start paying the direct contact workers, oh, let's say $25 an hour instead no, no, of the eight effing dollars an hour that most of them are making. I'm going to shut up. That's because 70% of them are for profit and private yeah. equity is the ones that's invested in them. And they've can invested- we go burn down a hedge fund? Can services. I do that? Right. Can somebody point me in one? Because I'd like to go burn down a hedge fund. They're all virtual <laughs> right now, Casey. Nice you go. Oh, I'll find them. <laughs> They're all virtual. <laughs> ratio those bastards. So, so Matthew, I want to make a comment in general about policies. We can make all the policies that we want. It's the enforcement. We've known for how long that there's problems with nursing homes and the shortcomings, and they've been cited and they have violations. But the state or whoever's in charge isn't doing anything about it. It's the same thing. There has to be fines. It has to be financial consequences or legal consequences. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to see any change. These things have been in existence for years and they've skirted under the radar. Let, let me add something to that. Uh, first of all, there was a good article in uh, the website, The Conversation, which is academics writing in plain English, a, a new study on for-profit nursing homes. So I, recommend theconversation.com. I was on a, um, a national commission on quality long-term care, 2007, 2008. 
And, you know, we've put a lot of recommendations. I think it's right that they don't enforce. And then uh, a, a few years ago, my uh, uncle was in a nursing home and um, b before he died and, and, and the nurses didn't answer the uh, uh, call button. I think it was a weekend, perhaps they thought they were doctors. Uh, in any event, uh, uh, and, and I, I, I wanted to, to find how I could complain, right? So here I am, uh, you know, incredibly knowledgeable, right? How do you file a complaint around the nursing home other than, you know, telling the nursing home itself, right? And so I did what anybody in my position would do. I wrote a note to uh, 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 Dr. Conway at, at CMS, who I knew and said, you know, how, how do I complain? And he sent it to some regional contractor for CMS this was in Virginia, who's in Richmond, who covered the Virginia, right? Well, even I wouldn't have thought of that. God knows anybody else. And who the heck would think that some regional whatever, and the, so you, you can't even find an effective way to complain. And, and when you combine that with kind of the fact that nursing homes have been hands off from the rest of the healthcare system. The best great. regulatory environment money can buy. Well, the, the, the case is right. As a regulator, um, Dr. Conway sending your complaint to the region actually was the right channel. Oh, I know it was the All right the thing. All the enforcement of HHS rules happens oh, at the oh, region. I understand level. it was the right thing. What I'm saying though is if I had tried to figure out how to file that complaint directly, I never would have been able to figure out that right. a guy who was nursing home in, in suburban Virginia, DC, that there was some contractor somewhere in Richmond that I had to file it with. And that, that, that was the problem. That's because you got to tweet about know. it. You got to tweet we about know. it. Uh, that, oh, I also tried, by the way, speaking of everybody loved tweeting, okay, so when, when my uncle was in a hospital, like in the Innova system, okay, and he couldn't get, like, anybody to bring him his paper, he'd been transferred at midnight because it had to be somebody who was in the, 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 that had a deal with Kaiser or whatever, right, okay, I tweeted the fact that here you guys have some award for how patient-centered you are and everything else like that, and my uncle is sitting there and, you know, nobody's paying attention. Nothing. So then I did the old fashioned thing and I called the administrator's office and left a message and that worked. So sometimes social <laughs> media is incredibly effective where other things are. And sometimes they ignore you no matter what you do. So right, but, yeah, but that's in nursing homes, hospital. How do you get the system to respond to you? And you know, as Casey knows better than anyone, it's a real problem. And you too. So, so, so let's have a, let's have a culture up. I want to drag, drag in Casey here and, and, uh, Devon and Grace, particularly on this issue, right? So a lot of this is around, uh, as Laura said, we've funded some parts of the healthcare system really, really well, and we have underfunded other parts or have, you know, right. we haven't thought about this. We've tended to do, and it's no secret, anybody here who spend a lot of money in, folks who do uh, bariatric surgery, <laughs> I kid Raj, but, you know, and the cath labs, you know, the neurology suites, the, 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 you know, they, the neurosurgery suites, they, they print money for, hospitals, there's a bunch of places that lose money. And, you know, there's this, as Ian was saying the other day, Ian Morrison was saying the other day, you know, we, we cross subsidize it to the extent the German health minister goes, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> um, so, but one area that we've done a very poor job, you just raised it, Michael, is the moving data and records about. So Casey, before we, uh, as we're on video here, tell us about your chest. Oh, well, it's, uh, it doesn't scan anymore. Um, I have long been frustrated with the lack of data interoperability in healthcare, and I got so tired of it that uh, I uh, rolled my own and nailed it to my chest. This is my HIE, but it, it only scanned for about two and a half years, but it certainly is a political statement. And the page still exists. It has updated documents. Um, mm -hmm. There's even a password. See, under here, there's a password. Boop, boop, boop. But when it scanned, it would open a page on one of my websites, invite you to put in a password, boop, 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 then you get two documents. You get my full health history back to the year dot, and and you know all the cancer treatments, everything else, la la la. And um, although I didn't put my knee replacement in it yet, got to update it. But and my advanced directive because everyone should have one of those. But my 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 you know sort of watershed pivot moment of why I'm in healthcare now. I was still working in television as a producer and engineer back in the day. I risked an assault charge in a hospital hallway in defense of my mother who was lying there dying in an Inova hospital 
Um, and the attending was like, well, your mother's had a long life. That was the first thing he said to me when I asked what the prognosis and the, and the plan was. So I literally had him up against the hospital hallway and um, I scared him enough that he moved her to the cardiac care unit, which is where she got the meds titration she needed. And she lived another seven, eight, nine years, some period of years. And so I put that in the win column, but I didn't realize that was my pivot point into healthcare. But looking back, that was it. Um, but you know, that's literally what people have to do to get the care they need sometimes is put your, you know, you have to risk an assault charge to get what you need. And I'm happy to do that for people. I, I'll do it on my own behalf, obviously. It's your I'll do it for people I care about. But I don't see why that should happen. I don't see why somebody has to send me in with my <laughs> sword and shield to get like the care they need. What the hell, people? <laughs> you know, it's, Grace, it's, how many people um, have you assaulted in this process? Uh, <laughs> I'm not, no, no comment. You know, I, and you know what, when you have, I think what the problem is, is people don't realize the work that patients need to do and their families need to do. When you cross that line of going from an acute, so you have your, I, I describe the patient experience as a spectrum. You have your, your proactive wellness seekers, healthy, acute encounter, divide to chronic illness, multiple comorbidities, earth shattering diagnosis. Once you cross over into chronic illness, earth shattering, there is serious work that needs to be done and there is not an appreciation of the level of specialty and integrity that a patient and their family need to do. And it all stems from having access to your medical records. There's no other way to do the work and really that's the source of patient autonomy and that's our greatest patient engagement strategy that we haven't fully unlocked yet. Evan, I want you to remind us it's getting better, right? Well, no, Vince, start, Vince started, uh, kicked us off with this, with his, with his story about the public health department where the reports just flow in. Taiwan. You, you, you know, we just dream of a society where the, where the information goes where it's supposed to go, when it's supposed to go, all the information that's needed digitally seamlessly without a damn fax machine and without a huge amount of work. And, and that includes two patients so that they can have it. And I think one of the, one of the many tragedies about the timing of this virus, which very badly timed, very badly timed, because we had come to the realization that as a country, we needed to put several things into place in order to have greater interoperability of health data, to have the kind of data flows that we thought we'd already bought back in the high-tech era, but we didn't get there. So now we have these new rules and they were highly controversial and they landed. And then two days later, you know, pandemic declared globally, national emergency declared, and suddenly, not only are they off everyone's radar screens, but we have healthcare providers across the country begging for more time to implement, frankly, the very provisions that they should have been implementing all along and the data flows that are gonna be necessary for us to fight this pandemic. Once again, taking a backseat. For how long? Especially as now we have a resurgence. That's the most distressing thing to me mm -hmm. is, I mean, loss of life, frankly, should be the most distressing thing for me. But what I'm focused on is helping people get their data and getting data to move where it's supposed to move. And all of the, the foundation that we've tried to lay in place, once again, delay, 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 because we're far too busy fighting a, a pandemic that frankly, we need data to fight. And, and you know, I, 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 wanna, I wanna tie what, what Devin said to uh, Matthew, your question earlier. When you look at policy, what are we gonna get? Uh, the fact is, is that, okay, Biden's elected, not elected. If, if we start to have a second wave in this country, which is not at all unlikely, we're going to have panic, right? And we're not going to be doing healthcare policy. We're going to be doing medical uh, uh, man the barricades, right? Uh, we're going to be having divisions exacerbated. We're going to be having, you know, instead, instead of talking about uh, sharing data, we're going to be talking about sharing toilet paper. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, that was a metaphor, but but the, 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 that part of the point is that we like to talk rationally about policy because all of us really would like to see rational policy, but in some ways we may be on the edge. And, and Devin was absolutely right about what we where we could have been, uh, but it it's it's skating the edge of are we going to go back to a place where we have enough sort of psychic room to talk about policy, or are we going to be in a state of panic again? Yeah, I'll pose a question for us to, to be thinking about. 
of, uh, you know, where will we see another state lockdown? You know, I, I think uh, candidates are uh, Arizona. They put their hospitals on high alert. Uh, yeah. Texas, Florida, that that's not beyond the realm of possibility. Yeah, I think, I mean, if, if, if that happens, right, the politics of that is going to be extraordinary because Cal California kind of put up with it and New York had to. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, I know. I looked earlier this morning. The stock market, the Dow Jones, was down fourteen hundred points. You know, maybe, maybe that's what we need for the burning platform. But but it's but, but I mean, you joke about it. But like I was saying, the Tesla stock. Uh, we're about to Taiwan. I saw I saw a thing on Facebook today of a of, a, of an autopilot Tesla crash in Taiwan, like the one in Florida a couple of years back. <laughs> to, to remind me of Taiwan, um, Tesla stock. You know. When was it 950 before this fell up, before the whole world fell apart? Went down to 300 because it was all over and, and production stopped. Production started up again. It's doing well in China again. China's opened up again. Went up to over a thousand. Most valuable car company in the world, worth more than Toyota yesterday. Now it's off like 50 or 60 bucks today, back down again because the world's, the world's going crazy and the stock market's uncertain. But there's no question that unemployment, you know, if there was some bounce back, some people are going back to work. But many, many businesses are, out, are, are going away, have gone away. Many of those retail locations, you know, many of those uh, shopping malls are not going to come back. They've all begged for, for no rent. I mean, there's a lot of problems going on. They just actually liberalized up a little bit the, the PPP stuff the other day, which is going to enable people to, who are small businesses to, to think a bit more rationally about how to spend that government money. But nonetheless, we've got a world of hurt to go through as, as a society without a bounce back of of uh covid as you say we might get it and I, and I don't know how you would convince people who shut down to bend the curve and it all worked it was all fine and you know and wandered around the bay area or one were in the middle of the country and didn't see the surge you know they put they put the jet was it the, the javits center what's the one the mccormick center in chicago michael which are, where they they put up a field hospital and nobody came and that possible you know, people are gonna say it's crying wolf forget it um i think you know it's gonna be very hard to get people especially <clears throat> people who've had their kids at home for how many weeks it is now and are desperate to get them out of the house to figure out, well, this is as serious as we said it was. So I think we have a, a, a long way to think about it. So that's the question is, can we, can we lock down another stage? Maybe. All right, and with that little rant, we're almost out. So I'm just going to end the way I normally end, which is to go around and ask you, what do you expect to see or what are you hoping to see in the next week or two? And I'll start with Devin. So I think we're going to start to see some real data on just how much these mass protests, the impact that that mass protests have had on the COVID-19 cases. And I hope that we can start to find other ways to keep the heat on um, the racism issue, because I think this, this entire conversation, while painful, has been very good for the country. Um, but we have to find a way to still keep having it without putting, um, putting so many of our young people at risk and everyone right. else too. I think in general on this whole topic of misinformation, uh, we should all be very diligent and link with other credible sources, rank, link with your networks to try to dispel any misinformation and check on your science and evidence-based medicine and data people because they're not okay. We're not okay with all of this happening. So check in and, and, and dispel whatever myths and misinformation you see right at the root so we could spread good, solid evidence. Michael. I think we're going to see an acceleration of a trend that actually is going to be making it very difficult to shut down if we have to. And that's the bifurcation between the good news that we're going to be promises around the corner. There's going to be more good news about possible vaccines and possible treatments and possible tests. And all the companies can say our tests are starting to think there's going to be lots of prospective good news while a steady drip of more and more cases, more and more people dying is happening. And will people look at the president and say, ah, that's going to be over any day now because of all this great good news on the horizon? Or are they going to look at the good news on the horizon and say, you know what? Uh, it's on the horizon and who knows when it arrives and how good it's going to be. And we have to really take care now. I think it's going to be a real challenge. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll end where Devin started. You know, we've, we're, I think the CNN article that I read said 14 states are seeing increasing numbers of, of cases. Uh, two angles of that. One is, you know, the science. What do, what do the numbers continue to look like? But probably more importantly is will we see some political leaders uh, 
do the things that are actually necessary and come back? Will someone at the state level say, you know, hey, we messed up. We got to do something drastic. We we do have a burning platform here. Let's watch for that. Raj. Um, sadly, I think we're going to see news reports next week of um, patients who've come in for diagnostic selective surgery who then caught COVID and become sick and have to go back into the hospital. Um, and uh, I don't know what the plan is, you know, from a health system perspective and a society perspective when those reports start coming through. And Casey. Well, I think that the cities, including my own, that have seen a lot of street protests around Black Lives Matter in the time of COVID, despite the fact that everybody's been wearing masks, I do think that our state, which has always kind of been a little bit on the bubble, it's like, well, we're kind of good, but maybe not. And the way they're reporting data sucks because they're conflating, um, you know, all kinds of re you know, positive cases, positive according to whom. And they're conflating a lot of, um, you know, serology along with PCR tests, which is like, what? So, uh, but I do think that there's going to be a strong second wave as early as this week, um, you know, this coming week or, you know, by the beginning of July. And the second thing I'm worried about is on Juneteenth, which is next Friday, we could have an American crystal knocked. If you want to know about that, ask me offline. Yeah, it's uh, pretty pretty damn frightening, especially as Trump heads to Tulsa. Well, Tulsa on Juneteenth. Yeah. That's my point. Yeah. That will become possibly the American crystal knot. Well, let's uh, look out. Let's keep our fingers crossed about that one. Okay, well, I'm going to end with something not quite as hopefully uh, dire as that, but I mean, I, I think that that we are going to have another as things tick up and as Raj says things like we have a possible second wave of COVID or infections in the hospital. I think it's going to be a lot more discussion and examination as, as people realize what's been going on in the health system over the last few years. We talked about non, uh, not spending enough time and effort on chronic care, not spending enough time and effort on, on and, and money and resources and figuring out how to do uh, uh, you know, care for the, uh, the, the very elderly well. Um, we have all these hospitals, which have got these big endowments who have been taking money from the federal trough. As things get, you know, are they going to look at what's going to happen, say we're back to normal, or are they going to start saying we need to figure out, you know, new ways of thinking about these? And that, those conversations that are going to start happening, whether it leads to any change with the RCMS or elsewhere, who knows? But that conversation, I think, is going to tick up in the next couple of weeks and it'll be highly influenced by what the healthcare system has to put up with. So that's my, uh, that's my uh, going away. So with that, we are done. I want to really thank uh, the entire gang today, especially. Uh, uh, patient extraordinaire and quiet, quiet demure person, uh, Casey Quinlan, who you can find at Mighty Casey on Twitter and also at the Healthcare is Hilarious podcast. I'm sure anywhere you can find it like your favorite podcast. And yes, I will be on there soon, uh, Casey, I apologize. And then regulars, Raj Agwal from uh, Jefferson Health System in Philadelphia, Grace Cordovano from the, uh, for the, the, the now opened up state of New Jersey, patient advocate extraordinaire, Vince Caradis from the wilds of, of Idaho, uh, Devin McCraw, uh, hanging out in Silicon Valley, where she's a uh, uh, pushy, pushy entrepreneur at a citizen, <laughs> citizen where you get your get your health records from anywhere. And Michael Millinson, patient advocate from the wilds of Chicago. That's the THTB gang for the 11th of June. I'm Matthew Holt, your host. Thanks for watching and listening. Bye now. <laughs>